Hello, critics, non-critics, and friends. Welcome to the Film Optics Podcast, where we take a glance into blockbusters, indie films, and everything in between. I'm your host, Christian, and today I'm actually joined by a special guest of the podcast, friend of the show, Amanda, a.k.a. AMX NDA Reviews on Instagram, Twitter, and Letterboxd. And today we're here to present... Our spoiler review of Dune Part 2, directed by Denis Villeneuve and has a whopping cast, uh, written by uh, Denis Villeneuve as well as uh, Frank Herbert being on as a credit. (laughs) He's the author. The author of, yes, yeah, credited uh, Frank Herbert. I'm sorry, guys. It's been a very long day. And we also have John Spates uh, joining the writing crew as well. And yeah, if you haven't seen Doom Part 2 yet, I'd be very shocked why you're even listening to this. But, you know, if you've seen it, you already know who's who's in the movie. We got Zendaya, Timothy Chalamet, Rebecca Ferguson, Christopher Walken, Florence Pugh. There's... This is a stacked cast, and it's fantastic. If you want to check out our spoiler-free review, we do have a separate episode of that um, out on the podcast, and I'll actually link it in the episode notes of this podcast for people who may want to just like easily redirect to it all together. But, Amanda, it's been a while since you've been on the show. How you been? What's going on? I know it's been so long. I don't even remember. What was the last one? The last one you've been on? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> was it, it was last year. I'm pretty sure. Was it that 90s show? That was last January. Oh, no. You were over, <laughs> that was last January. <laughs> um, you came on for the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. That's, That's what, it what it was. I was like, it was last year. I'm pretty sure I did another book. Yeah, yeah, it was that, and I think we did Killers, too. We did Killers of the Flower Moon. I think you did as well, um, yeah. Back to oh, back, for- yeah. See, I forgot we did that one. <laughs> yeah, it was back to back, but I'm happy to be back with another book adaptation. Um, but yeah, things are good. I started a new job, and I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just balancing life now and seeing how things can go for me and just restructuring things, doing a lot of reading, and uh, yeah, it's been good. You read way more than me. I need to catch up on my reading. It's been bad. It's like multitasking. So I have one on my Kindle that I bring to work, one like paperback and then one audio book. So it's like three books a month that I'm doing and I don't know how I've been doing it, but it's been fun. So it's interesting. I have a question. Um, Yeah. So for us audio book listeners out there, do you Mm -hmm. consider that? As reading. Of course I do. I think it's, I think you retain the information differently, but it's still like in your head and it's giving you a full story. And I think listening to a narrator that's actually good will make you really appreciate the book in a different way. So yeah, no, it's definitely considered reading because people I think have different reading styles as well. Um, so that's another thing. It's like, if you're a visual learner, like you just take things in differently. So yeah. 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 It's weird. Cause like for me, like I used to read a lot when I was younger, but like now that I'm older, it's like, I still own like the books of like, even for like the audio books that I have. So like I'm reading fourth wing. Um, I need to start back up because I was really into it. And then like, life and stuff happens. So I'm trying to get back into it, but I'm mm-hmm. not only just listening to the audible, I'm listening to the graphic audio of fourth wing. It's like a movie. Oh, the head. dramatized version. Yeah the, yeah. yeah. the dramatized version. It is nice. Fantastic. I'm Yay. like, I like this a lot. And, and I do like the story. It's getting really good. 
It's so good. I'm so happy you started reading it. It's getting spicy. <laughs> oh yeah. There's a little bit there's a little bit of spice. I forgot to tell you that, but there's a little bit of spice. No, it's totally it uh, cuz my friend was like you should yeah, my other friend he was like yeah, you should probably stick to fourth wing instead of the court of thorns and roses. He's like that's He's like it's something else, but it, like he likes it, but he was just like, you know, he he's into it. So he thought yeah. I would enjoy fourth wing more and i i am i gotta buy the second part of the graphic audio yes. i think it already came out but like it now did. i'm afraid i can't go back to just like a standard audio listening experience that's interesting i think i've i think i've only done dramatized versions really? yeah i they take a little bit longer to come out but it's yeah yeah and unless, unless i haven't i think i did one or two dramatized um, but it's a different experience, which is awesome that it's getting you back into, you know, the audio books and it's helping, you know, it's yeah. really good. But definitely like, yeah. even if it's the, a non dramatization version, mm-hmm. like a non graphic audio, if it's just like the standard audible, um, depending on who the author is, he can yeah. really get you into it. So like when I, for the ballot sombers and snakes, I forgot who the guy was, but like, he basically sounded like president snow as if he was like a younger guy and i was oh, like i liked sick. his voice it was pretty cool that's but awesome. he didn't do the voices but still it was pretty awesome um yeah but that's tatiana good. maslani she is the um audio uh narrator for the hunger games for the first three hunger games books i didn't know that that's so cool it's she, she does a great, great, great job yeah. yeah, she, she tries she to go like low it. with like Fida and stuff. I'm like, it's so no. funny. <laughs> She's adorable. I love her. It's hilarious. But I've yet to check out Dune. I have the audio book. Mm, it's a long I one. Know. <laughs> I know. I, I have did. the book too. I was like, wow, this yeah. is massive. And this is, it's this is like, only the beginning. I think it's 864 pages from Ooh. what I remember. I think it's still the longest book that I've read. Because I read it during lockdown. Yeah, I read it during lockdown and I was like, oh my God, like it's never ending. It's so dense. It's so dense. And that's why when like you watch Dune, um, more so part two, I think they do a better job in breaking down the themes um, and the story uh, for the audience because the book is like I got lost so many times trying to understand the politics um, and I do think that not to compare it to Star Wars, but the political jargon in Star Wars in comparison to the Dune films, it's like night and day. Like I can understand everything that's happening in Dune one, uh, part one and part two, but then trying to understand the politics in Star Wars is like, I can't even <laughs> register them at all. That's actually, that's interesting you say that. And I, I think I actually agree. And I don't mm-hmm. know why, because for the longest time, it's like, okay, like the Empire and Star Wars was just very like, they're the bad guys. I'm like, well, why? Like, I know what they're kind of sort of trying to do. But yeah. honestly, it wasn't until I started watching Andor. I was like, oh, <laughs> like that makes it. more sense. <laughs> yeah. Which is funny yeah. because Dune is, I mean, Dune's like the grandfather of like space fantasy, like like sci-fi much like yeah. Lord of the Rings is for high fantasy. So it's like, you don't yeah. get Star Wars without Dune. Yeah, so that's the, that's the best part about it. I'm yeah. like, I, I, it's really like the original Star Wars, but I, I love, I've been watching like so many videos. I'm like, like I want to read the book, but I'm like, man, that author, <laughs> not the author, the, the, the narrator for the audio book. I'm like, See, I would oh. actually, I know. And that's why I suggest like actually reading it because you're going at your own pace and I think you'll be able to like understand it more. Um, and I've been telling people because like there's 20 books in this series, like there are spinoffs and there are sequels, like the, the original uh, saga basically I think is like six books. Um, and what I was told, like I did research on it, you'd only really have to read Dune and then Dune Messiah for Paul's arc. Right. Um, and that's it. Like you don't even have to go past that. So even if you just want to read like Dune Messiah after this and call mm. it a day, like you're fine. Cause technically those are the only films that Denis is going to actually 
make. And like those are, then I think, um, there's this sisterhood of Dune, which is the show on HBO. And that's a spinoff yeah. too. Yeah. And there's also, well, I know that I think after Dune is, I think children of Dune is the next book after. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, huh? Interesting. But yeah, I just thought it was pretty interesting before we kind of like dive into the actual Dune part two spoilers. But, um, yeah, I would love to get your perspective, your, your reactions of Dune part two. You know, this is the spoiler cast. So we're just kind of talking, you know, shooting the shots and, you know, just talking about what we loved about the movie. We already, you know, we could just talk about whatever I was, it was so hard to do it for a non spoiler. I was like, there's so much I can here. imagine. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, even like, there was so much I found out throughout the videos, but I'm going to shut up now. What are your initial thoughts on Dune Part 2? Spoilers included. <laughs> yeah, I I thought that the film was brilliant. I think Denis Villeneuve has mastered the sci-fi genre. Um, I've been a huge fan of his work, uh, for a while now. And I think that if you watch all of his films and then watch Dune part two, and I said this in my review, it feels like a culmination of everything that he's done. Like you can pull from Arrival, you can pull from Blade Runner 2049, um, and you can pull from his other films and see that he incorporated all of that in Dune part two. Uh, and Denis is so very talented that he can create the, like, this grand space opera and still grounded in very human themes. And that's what we get with Dune part two more so than Dune part one. Um, and I think that I was just amazed by the scale of this film. And I said that with Dune part one as well. And if you hopefully watched it on 70 millimeter and IMAX, you're going to be like just amazed by everything that like Greg Frazier, sorry, Greg Frazier did, uh, with the cinematography and then, you know, the production design, the costuming, like everything is just so rich. Um, and then there's so much depth to these characters as well. And I think that every single person in this cast gave incredible performances, um, and they worked together extremely well. I was just very impressed with this. I, I could, could have sat there for four hours it felt so short to me and I did not feel this runtime. Whereas with Doom part one, I did feel the runtime just because I did read the book and I didn't know where it was going to end. Um, so that was the only thing why, where I gave doom part one, four and a half, just because of the pacing issue. And then part two just had incredible pacing throughout, never wavered, never a dull moment. And everything was really quick. Um, and I felt like in comparison to the book, especially the second half of the book, um, Denis picked out the the bones of it and it was still meaty enough to actually give us a full like two hour and 48 minute uh, film. So I think it was just exceptional all around and it's one of the best sequels ever made. I'm glad you said that because I I agree. I agree. It is one of the Mm -hmm. best sequels ever made. Um, There was actually a tweet that I saw. Um, someone said that they loved Doom part two, but they didn't consider it a sequel because it's the second part to uh, a single story. And I was like, I I don't, I was like, okay, nothing, at least to me, I'm like, okay, but like, I don't know. It's like, it's still considered a sequel terminology wise. So like nothing about like nothing about what a sequel requires it to be a story in and of, of itself. Like, mm-hmm. cause you could say the same thing with star Wars. It's like, okay, the original star Wars trilogy, like that's telling one giant story. You're just breaking it up into mm-hmm. three parts. Yeah, exactly. And I think that each, I think when it comes to a part two or a sequel, and this can be said about across the spider verse as well, mm-hmm. Dune part one technically did not end on a cliffhanger. I felt it didn't end on a cliffhanger. Like it was like it ended and like you could have just had part one and it would have ended with like, this is just the beginning. It's like, okay, cool. Like we're not even getting a part two. That's fine. Like you can end the film um, there, but like something with across the spider verse and even mission impossible dead reckoning. Like there's such a stark difference where across the spider verse ended on a massive cliffhanger. Mm. You know what I mean? So then when that, when the part two comes out that that's going to feel like, 
those movies are combined where Dune right. part one and part two is just not, it doesn't feel that way for me. Cause even with part two, like it, it ended, but it still doesn't feel like a cliffhanger to me with that ending. But I know mm. what happens because of Dune Messiah. So it just, I don't know. It's a weird, it's a fine line of what like guidelines you kind of like uh, use when it comes to like a part one, part two or a sequel, I guess. Yeah. And it's, it's also like, you know, what was it? Kill Bill volume one and volume two mm -hmm. where Quentin Tarantino's like, yeah, it's one movie. And then everyone's like, well, yeah, but I bought two movie tickets. So it's two separate ones. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, even with like Lord of the Rings, like fellowship of the ring, you could technically like, it ended. I don't know. It's, it technically, it did technically ends. Yeah. But it's like the story's not over, so it's like mm -hmm. it's weird. I mean, I I see. I forgot who had tweeted that, but like, I I see what or where they were coming from. But mm -hmm. you have to like if if that's your way of thinking, then no trilogy, like no like no movie like sequel, like The Dark Knight, like that's not really considered a sequel. Then if you're saying that Doom Part Two isn't a sequel. And it's like, yeah. well, all these are telling stories is a part one and two and three, you know, beginning, middle mm -hmm. and ends. But yeah. yeah, it's, it's weird. It's, that's pretty, pretty odd. But yeah, I just thought I'd yeah. bring it up. I was like, huh? Like, cause some people do think, think that way. Cause it's like, they do. I yeah. mean, I, I also feel like people need something to complain about. That too, always. You know, <laughs> and we see that quite a bit. So I think that's yeah. why people are like, but this movie is like so overhyped and it's like, let's nitpick. And I think that's what people are doing now. It's not even been out like a week and people are already like, it's so overhyped. It's so overrated. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, sure. For me, it feels like Doom Part 2 has been out for like over a month. Technically for me, because I saw it on February 20th. <laughs> And I couldn't really I, yeah. talk about it with anyone. And now I can. Yeah. Now we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I watched it on the, I think I watched it on the 25th. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see it, it in 70 millimeter IMAX? Oh, hell yes, I did. Same. That was an experience. That I had went downtown to my, my screening and it was completely sold out. And that IMAX holds 400 people. Yeah. Wow. It was crazy crazy yeah that's insane i took my friends colin shout out to colin mm -hmm. awesome hey. colin out there <laughs> follow them on tiktok they do good stuff um it was my since it was my second time seeing it colin's first time seeing it mm -hmm. and luckily we live in a city where there is a 70 millimeter imax theater yes. and yeah. yeah it like literally we were trying to figure out where did it where did it go on like friday saturday or sunday Mm -hmm. And literally every single IMAX screening showtime was packed. Luckily, yeah. we found two seats right next to each other. Kind of like towards nice. the middle. I was actually kind of surprised. But nice. yeah, like every single like seat was just filled. And Same. I feel like with this movie, I'm like, it's, it's truly something special. Because it's like, it not is. only does it, it enhances the first film. Mm -hmm. But... You know, it's a sequel that builds upon the events of its predecessor, but it also surpasses it. And it's like it's shining even brighter and brighter, like the mm -hmm. storytelling, not even just the storytelling, like the score, the writing, the cinematography. I don't know who they hired. <laughs> but Greg Frazier, my friend, Greg Frazier. Every time I go to Iraq, it's whether it's Doom Part 1, Part 2. It's it literally feels like a real place. It's incredible. Like. You can't like there's usually, you know, with some movies you can tell, oh yeah, like that's some spotty CGI. Like you can't you can't you can't tell you. Can't. you. I'm like even even them like like floating down from this the spacecrafts, yeah. like it was just so graceful. Like you can't even not that you would tell that there are wires, but you're like, yeah, this guy can totally just do that. And it was so believable. Like I was blown away by so much. And like to even speak on that whenever because there's more action scenes in part mm. two than there is in part one the stealth of the fremen yes oh my god <laughs> like i i was like i got goosebumps every single time they came out of the sand or they were just coming out of nowhere Heck i was yeah. just blown away <laughs> like and you know what i loved that denise did i know like i'm jumping all over the place but um 
what I love that Denis did, and he's he's talked about it, and people have given him kind of like some shit for it, but he let these scenes breathe, and there were there was like silence on screen majority of the time, and I think to have silence on like a seventy millimeter screen is just unreal work from him because he's letting the visuals speak for themselves and mm. that's why it just pulls something different from the audience because there was tension and like in so many different scenes and they were barely saying anything yeah it's it's the visual storytelling that Denise is able to pull off and yeah. even like this the subtlety of like just the production even with like Chani and like, I'm not sure if anyone really knows this for any listeners out there. I, again, I learned this from a YouTube video, but I think it's so cool. So when she, when I guess when the Fremen fall in love, mm-hmm. they um, wear blue. Yeah. And so I'm not sure. And I didn't notice this on my first watch. Cause there, there are scenes where Chani is wearing like a blue, like headband or like a bandana. Like sometimes she has it like, on her head sometimes it's on her um like on her left or right arm Mm -hmm. so it's like signifying that she has fallen in love with paul Mm -hmm. and during that last scene no blue bandana to be found (laughs) i know she she wears it like not the entire time it's like in certain scenes and other scenes she doesn't but yeah i was like because i was like oh does she wear it like as in she still loves Paul, because like it was a pretty big portrayal. But this man gave up. So this was like an episode of Love Is Blind. It was crazy. He was like, "Yeah, I'll marry the uh, the emperor's daughter." I was like, well, "That was a twist." And it's yeah. Not only that, I didn't know that Paul was half Harkonnen, because I'm like, there has to be a twist in here somewhere. I'm like, why is Paul like so important? But you know, more yeah. so is his his mother's. Uh, lineage than his own and I'm like oh so he's he's also Harkonnen and I'm like this is crazy I'm not sure how the you know how in Game of Thrones where it's like okay you know you're half Targaryen half snow but if your mm-hmm. father's a snow then you know or not a snow um my gosh a Stark, a Stark. Yeah, yeah Stark thank yeah. you yeah it's okay so it's like yeah <laughs> It's like, oh, he's a snow. Oh, my God, this is impossible. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's like if your father, it, you take your father's last name, like, you know, you are House Stark, or if your mm-hmm. father's Targaryen or House Tully, things of that nature. So I'm not sure how it works in Dune, but it's just, this is very much like Game of Thrones in space. It's insane. Yeah, it's so crazy. But the thing, I, I'm going to speak on that moment because I felt like it was so underplayed that like I don't think people even registered that he was a Harkonnen because mm. they didn't play it like it's such a massive reveal. It was right. it wasn't even like done that way. I felt like it was a bit too subtle for my liking. Um, but the grandfather line was just like, oh my god, he's gonna kill his <laughs> his granddad and yeah. all of that. I just think that with Paul as a character, I I hope that people like how can I put this that they don't like him there. He's not so you're not supposed to like Paul moving forward. Like there's a massive change in him when he drinks the, the blue yeah. juice. Uh, and you can see that. And I think people who like, I'm not saying the general audience won't pick up on it because obviously there's visual cues and all of that. But I think for those who just like, didn't expect him to be bad <laughs> was like, <laughs> what is happening? It's like, no dude, like you can clearly see that there's a prophecy. Like the prophecy is not supposed to be a good thing from the Bene Gesserit. It's like you have to, anyways, yeah. it's a whole thing, but he's not a good person. <laughs> he's not a good person. That's it. And then the love triangle at the end. Yeah. My God, when everyone bows down and then mm. it's just like Princess Arul and Chani and Paul standing <laughs> up. I'm like, Denis, what are you, what are you doing? Like, it, it was, was just crazy. intense. Yeah. And like the battle, Fade Rotha. Mm. Oh, we got to talk Ra- about yeah. Austin Butler. <laughs> like the you man know, I'm a little is disappointed he didn't come in with his uh, Elvis impression. <laughs> he, you know what? It was there. In it was there a little lines, bit. It was. I was it like, was. I noticed. I was like, Austin. Austin. What are you doing, man? Come it's like, oh, on. you're my cousin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the one. Is your cousin really? The I was like, fact oh, that you, yeah, you called it. That was the line. I was like, oh, no. 
I was like, I was no, like no, that's no. it. That's it. There it is. <laughs> no, but yeah, we, we could definitely talk about because are the Harkonnens, are they bald in the novel or was that just more of a visual change? From my knowledge, they were like I, from what I remember, they were. Yeah. I think they all like look in the, the, the same like they they're all in unison. Gotcha. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. But w- what I really liked, because, again, Greg Frazier and the costuming uh, department, they had also, like, color cues where, like, if you were going to the Emporium with the Emperors, it was all, like, like grays and blues, like, to show that they're royalty and, like, silvers. Mm. And then you had, like, obviously it was black and white for the Harkonnens to show how crazy they are basically and it was just like really <laughs> deep dark colors and yeah. then obviously with uh what's it called with um the fremen it was all like browns and greens and like i painted my nails uh for the color palette of the fremen uh just to match but i think that that just enhanced all of the performances as well and that you could tell where you were before they even showed who was on screen which is really cool and then the Harkonnens, they had the infrared uh, that they used. Greg Fraser wanted to use that for the battle sequence in the arena for Fade Rotha. Mm. And that's why it looked the way it did. And it was so sick. So the fact that they played with like color palettes and textures like that was really cool. Yeah, the Black Sun was like insane. I was like, yeah. wow, this is crazy. And seeing it a second time, it's, you know, like obviously the first time you're, you're trying to absorb all the information. You're like, Oh my God, what's yeah. happening? You're like, I don't know what's happening, but I absolutely love it. Um, yeah. but yeah, even the second time I was like, wow, just like the, the subtle differences, like even with the heart ends, like the black sun and with Austin Butler's character, it was like, he, he remind like everyone says like, like the Joker. I'm like, I can definitely see the Joker. Me as like mm-hmm. an anime, like weeb fan. I was thinking like Frieza. Cause like, I was like, he just looks like him, but he acts like a total savage, but I love mm-hmm. the, uh, I don't know. It's, it's kind of like between Paul and what's Austin Butler's name again. It's Fade uh, Rotha. Fa- Fade Rotha. Thank you. Fade um, Rotha. Yeah, no they're, they're really like, two sides of the same coin because I remember again from a video Paul was <laughs> well and, and they actually mentioned this in the first film because Paul was originally supposed to be a girl well his mother was supposed to originally have a girl but then uh I think she bore his father a son his son father a son sorry the she um so out of love so it's like Paul was originally supposed to marry Phaedrotha. Kind of, if, if, am I saying that right? I, I don't know. I again, I got this from a video, um, so I'm not sure how accurate that is. That I, uh, can you not say anything without talking about Dean Messiah? Or is that? Mm, yeah, I can't say anything. Um, All right, it, blink twice for yes. No, I'm <laughs> joking. <laughs> I can't. I can't say anything. Um, okay, that's fine. That's fine. I do get that because it's a lot of like incest that goes on in Dune, and it's very, uh, clearly with this what is Game you of reveal. Thrones. Of Paul. <laughs> it is Game of Thrones. Like Paul's a Harkonnen, and you're like, hey, like what are you talking about? That Paul's a yeah. Harkonnen. Uh, but even like, like Fade Rotha with his like mommy issues that were evident, <laughs> and then that's what they said yeah. about him. Um, I think the lineage is tarnished, uh, yeah. and that's all I can really say that's fine and i uh, yeah because paul being paul i know that kind of disrupts a Mm -hmm. lot of stuff within for the bene gesturates plans but oh yeah for any anime fans out there paul (laughs) reminds me of aaron yeager from attack on titan but i'm just gonna say that because if if you've seen all of attack on titan there's a lot of similarities between Mm -hmm. uh aaron goes through a uh, massive change it, it's it's this weird that i can't talk so much on it but the paul that we see it towards the end of part two or just paul in general yeah especially mm. uh after he drinks the the water of life or yeah the water of life um it's it's very similar uh for aaron yeager nice. i'm like he he reminds me if i'm 100 percent 
But yeah, it's it's crazy how and like I agree with what you're talking about. Like I and I don't even think that was a big twist of Paul being uh Harkin on his mother's side, because we still don't know, like, okay, her his own mom didn't even know until she drank the water of life. And now we got Paul's little sister. Um Blanking on her name as well. But uh, she, oh, what was her name? Now I'm blanking. Because uh, I think in the, because she, is she originally born in the Dune book? The original book? No. No. Yes, no. Okay, no, it it's a, technically. That makes sense. It's fine. It, <laughs> it's like the begin. like she, he, she's pregnant and then right. like you do hear it. Like a while, uh, it, like at the end, but then it's heavy in Messiah. So they kind okay. of like, they Man, previewed. Messiah must be really good. <laughs> You're like, oh, kids. I'll Christian, <laughs> Christian, when I mean, I prefer Dune Messiah to the, like to Dune reading it. Cause it's really? like, I'm talking about like, shit hits the fan in Messiah. <laughs> like it's crazy. It's crazy. Like it's insane. I'm very I'm I'm excited because like you know the holy war is beginning uh, and it's yeah. like everything that's happening with Paul with him being this prophet it's mm-hmm. I mean Dune is so this even part 2 in itself it's still like relevant in like today's terms cuz I think yeah. the book came out around like 60 years ago but mm-hmm. um it's effectively you know using this like prophecy this religion of the fremen Mm-hmm. To like control them, and Shani's like, no, this is how they control us. It's just moving from one dictator to another. But yeah. I, because there's so many scenes in part one that we see that we don't see in part two, but I think it's more of the flashes of like visions of the future, where mm-hmm. there's like one with Shani and Paul. Like I think they're in Caladan like Paul's home world and they're like looking down. Yeah. Kind of like, I was like, what is, it's so crazy. Like I, I need to, I need to start reading, but like, I want to read Doom Messiah, but I don't. Cause I want to experience the movie first and then go back and read the book. But I, I don't yeah. know. It's, oh man. It's, 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 it's crazy. Heavy. And uh, the sister's heavy. name is um, Alia Al- or Aaliyah. Aaliyah, that's Aaliyah. Right. Yeah, it's so Aaliyah or something. Yeah, or one of them. Yeah. And then we, spoiler, we see that it's Anya Taylor Joy. And at first, like. I was going to ask. I was going to ask you if yeah. do, do you actually consider that a spoiler or not. Well, she shouldn't have gone to the premiere. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. Like, why are you there? And then she, she's, she does have like one scene in the movie. And I'm like, why, why would you go, man? Like, that's such a surprise. Cause technically, like I said, it's, it bleeds into Dune Messiah where they're talking right. and everything. And then she's like born and all of that. It just didn't mm. make any sense to have Anya there. Anyways, it is a spoiler. It technically is. So Yeah. I, I got yeah. you. At first, I was like, because I, I always thought that she was there because, like, you know, the, the reported findings or whatever. And I was like, yeah, mm-hmm. whatever. And then mm-hmm. apparently a lot of people were very disappointed when I think it was either Hollywood Reporter or Variety had, like, made that. But, like, I yeah, it's kind of like if they wanted to keep it a secret. Yeah, probably she, she shouldn't have, have gone, gone to it. <laughs> yeah, period. Like, girl, you're not even like credited until like the 40th person in like it just yeah. <laughs> like what do you don't go it's supposed to be like a cameo it's supposed to be a secret um because right. i didn't it know they were gonna though. show it was great i love her and then seeing it in context of the film i'm like yeah she would totally be like timmy's sister like it makes sense like there is Timmy's. some like it's some kind of resemblance for Paul. Like I like that, yeah. especially with Rebecca Ferguson too as the mother. Like it makes complete sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I really wish they would have kept that. Like even the talking fetus and showing the fetus on screen. I'm like, I get it. I think it was a bit much because I, I really like the scenes. It. Really, I, I liked it more where like um, Lady Jessica was speaking. To her, yeah, I really that, loved that was those cool scenes. Too. I, I did it too. It was sick. Yeah, yeah. I it was just it think, was freaky, but like 
Especially yeah. when she takes the the water of uh, the water of life and mm-hmm. like the fetus eyes, like I was like, oh my god, what's happening? Is this gonna be like a super baby or something? <laughs> yeah, it's like it's a super baby for sure. I just yeah, there were some things where I'm like, it went too far, but I guess you had to do it to yeah. show it. Yeah. In case people didn't catch it around the first time that she was pregnant in part one. <laughs> I mean, like he literally says it. So <laughs> yeah, like that's it's, the thing. It's, it's subtle. It's very subtle. Yeah, like it's, it's, very it's more subtle. visual storytelling. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. like, like it was insane when it's, I don't know, like the, the way that they're able to kind of like tell two stories almost and have kind of have them converge. Cause like the final mm-hmm. fight towards the end and, yeah. Paul just like it it was interesting because you know obviously he didn't want to go south he didn't want to become this prophet Mm -hmm. but it's like I I wasn't sure I'm like man like is it just a coincidence that he is able to do all these things but he's basically like a male Benny Jesuit because he because no male has uh, survived the the water like drinking the water of life so it's like yeah, there's a name for him. I forgot his name now. Is it Usul? It's not the Lisa. It's not no. That's Usul's the Fremen name, and then that's Lisa right. Nalgaib is the prophet, mm. um, and then Muad'Dib is his name that he takes up as like the um, the desert mouse. Like that's his name. Right. But the it's the Qua. I'm gonna butcher this. The Quasis the Quasitsa Haderach is yeah, technically the male Bene Gesserit. Yeah, there's a name for it. I butchered okay. it, but like that. Yeah, there hasn't been one, like you said. So now he has all of these names. And I remember reading the book and I'm like, but who, is it still him? Like, yeah. why are they not calling him like a certain name or whatever? But yeah, I guess it depends who meets him, who sees him. Right. And then they just adapt something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that that was the that was the interesting part. Even with like Javier Bardem, like he's he's the ultimate hype man for for Paul. You know, like he's <laughs> that's he, it, that's it. <laughs> like he became my favorite character after watching this. Like he's phenomenal in he this. Is. I loved him. Comic relief for sure. Like he was so good. Yeah, it, it was like subtle comic relief, and it's like yeah, it was funny. Yeah, and I I, I like how they were able to you see the Fremen like facing like you know the emperor or just not even the emperor's men but the mm-hmm. harkonnen's men or even the the final fight between uh Freyd and paul towards the end where mm-hmm. it's like I, I like how in dune and i, I feel like we kind of get this in star wars sometimes or not even just star wars just other properties or just other stories where there is you know this is like this is the fantasy element like this is like the sci-fi fantasy so because it's like it's it's set in space but that doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. mean that it's sci-fi like because i i yeah i identify star wars more being more fantasy than just a straight up sci-fi because like we're really getting into the weeds now with doom part two like you know the holy yeah. war is about to begin but i i, I like that. how you have like these fights where no one feels superhuman like anyone can mm-hmm. die at any moment. It's not like, you know, the final fight or the final duel towards the end of this film where it's like cousin versus cousin. Like no one mm-hmm. felt invincible. No. Because I agree. you have yeah, so like you have Paul who's this is like sec- technically the second time he's been reborn cuz I would say the first time he got what uh reborn is when he killed that one Fremen towards oh, the Janice. end. Oh, Janice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Janice. Yeah. So it's like, cause he never killed the person before then, but we didn't know that until then, but he's had mm-hmm. like the best stewards, the best teachers. So like he knows his way around the blade, but he mm-hmm. didn't feel invincible. Yeah. And that's what I, I really liked about it. And I think that that's a testament too to like Austin Butler's performance yeah. because Fade Rotha was like lethal. Like he sliced that one girl's neck just for like, that she opened her mouth basically. Yeah. Right. So I think I like, and then he almost like, um, I think he beat, what's his name too? David, Dave Batista's character. Yeah. He, like punched him or whatever, banged his head on. I think like, that the was table. his brother or is that his cousin? I can't remember. I think that's that also his cousin? cousin. I think it's I a think cousin. That's his cousin. Yeah, Cause it's I both so. nephews. So I think it's, I, I don't, maybe, I don't know. Um, but I think that you had to show how like crazy fade Rotha was 
to like have that battle even mean like, oh my God, Paul could get stabbed and die. But like Paul also has the Bene Gesserit power and he's like, okay, maybe like he'll kill Fade in a different way. And you know what I mean? And use the voice in that case. You don't know what that fight was going to be, but Mm. Christian, the hand to hand combat. Great. It was fantastic. I loved it so much. I'm like, I will take this over a lightsaber battle any day of the week. Literally like, that same. was amazing. I was like, And I the sound it. design, like you could hear like the mm. blades, you could hear the contact and it's probably like my favorite fight in like a very long time. It was so good. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. That was, that was phenomenal. And like, you know, yeah. it wasn't too long. It wasn't too short, but it's like, mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of people also underestimate Paul because when he killed his first kill, at the end of part mm-hmm. one, they're like, he was like, oh, you know, it's, it's, he's facing up against a Fremen. Like they, they view Paul as just like this prissy boy kind of guy where it's like, oh, yeah. you know, he's just, he's just a rich, uh, son, um, da- daughter of a, or son of like a steward or like a, of, of a great mm-hmm. house. But yeah. he, he knows his way around the blade and it's like, he can just, he's good. Like, you know, yeah. he's, he's going to take a few blows, but it's like, he, he's going to get the job done. Yeah, and, and yeah, I agree. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. It, no, no, <laughs> just it, it makes me <laughs> it makes me laugh that people are like Timmy can't be an action star and I'm like this isn't him being an action star though. Like it, it's it's not. a per- No, it's like it's perfectly cast for exactly what you just said. So I think that people saying that like he can't fight and it's like no, but he can. Like that's his purpose. He's supposed to be like this this um nobleman's son and like he's supposed to be like that he's like the duke's son it's like he can fight like you said so it's just it makes me laugh when everyone's like impressed with like with timothy chalamet doing literally anything and i'm like we've been new he can do everything like can we just put some respect on my boy's name it's so crazy that it took people like this long to respect him as an actor and I'm like, he's been putting in the work. It just, it yeah, bothers me. Yeah. yeah. It's just because he's not in a comic book movie or like, you know, another, yeah. like, but Dune's, this is like perfect for him. But like, I mean, I've always liked Timmy. I haven't watched mm-hmm. Wonka yet. I still got to watch that one. <gasps> so but good. I hear, I hear he's really good in it, but it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, like he's like literally all these actors have had like very like amazing careers. And it's for like, sure. even like Florence, Florence Pugh has been like, everywhere like i think my first film i saw with her was like i think it was either fighting for my family and then i watched her in lady Macbeth because that was like one of her yeah so like i've been i've I've pretty much watched like every film that florence Pugh has ever been in but like even timothy chalamet chalamet it's like he oh yeah he's he's good like just because he's not in you know star wars or whatever like he, he can get the job done like he's a phenomenal actor definitely so yeah. it's like, and even this, it's, it, I don't know. There's something, he's very intimidating. Yeah. But it's like, you know, he's just, he's just, he's, you know, he's a scrawny guy or whatever, but it's like, he's yeah. still. There's so much power. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. I was like, he, okay. Yeah. He brings a level of intensity that like you normally wouldn't get from someone that looks like that, I think. Um, so that's why it's really surprising. He, and, um. I, I said this in a, in a tweet actually that ev- like you have Dune Part Two and you have young Hollywood like being incredible in these roles in Dune Part Two that it's so special because once their careers like skyrocket it already has because they cemented themselves but it's just like you're never gonna get them all together in a movie once they actually like have the longevity of a Kate Winslet or a Leonardo DiCaprio, like, right. you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. it's going to be very different. So that's why it's even more special to have them all together here. I agree. Yeah. And Hollywood's definitely changed a lot. Cause it's like, you know, we're, we're seeing the like beginnings of a lot of these actors careers of like Zendaya, mm-hmm. Florence Pugh. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson has been around for a bit, but like still, well, heck even with uh, Dave Bautista, cause he's like, now getting into like 
the acting stuff, but yeah. heck, I mean, Austin Butler came a long way from iCarly. So. He did. Oh my God. No, I know. He's doing so well for himself. I really yeah. do think that Elvis opened the doors for him and I'm just really happy that he got to like strut his stuff and he's taking some unique projects on. Yeah. And I'm happy that like, I mean, obviously people are going to know him for Elvis, but like I'm happy he's like a lot of these actors even with like Zendaya and Florence Pugh, like they've mm. been, they, they've been in the MCU yeah. or are in the MCU, but it's like, they're still able to be a part of projects where it's like, Hey, you know, I've, I'm in a lot of things. I think we're kind of moving away from the, like the Harry Potter effect where it's like, I mean, granted there was eight movies, but it's like, yeah, it's like people only know them for that one thing. It's like I've seen plenty of movies with like, you know, the golden trio from the Harry Potter and other yeah. um, actors, too. But like, yeah, for a lot of people, I mean, to me, he's always going to be Harry Potter. You know, like that crew is always yeah. going to be like, well, that's not any Granger, even though, you know, whatever. But I, yeah. I like how I like how these actors or at least the younger actors when it's talking specifically like Austin Butler, Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya. Florence Pugh, they're able to kind of just hop around and just really just do what they want to do. It's like, yeah, you recognize them from other stuff, but it's like they, they don't stay in one place for too long. Mm -mm. And I, I like that too. To, yeah. And yeah. I think that's what you have to do nowadays. Like everyone knows, I mean, Zendaya came from, you know, Disney Channel. So it's like, it's crazy. She's killing it. She's become like the fashion icon of our generation. Like, I'm just so proud of everything that she's done. And like the fact that she's like even producer on Euphoria, like she's really challenging herself. And I think that's incredible for her. Um, I just I love what they're doing. And I think that the more they they become mainstream, they can bring in the fans to watch like euphoria to watch a bob dylan biopic to watch mm. the bike riders and you know what i mean like i think that that's what's so incredible about this is like you're becoming a fan for life like even yeah to branch out like a barry keegan a jacob alordi like you have them doing these indie films but they're so like accessible to the general audience that they're going to give the indie film a go too. And I think that's, what's awesome about this at the end of the day is that of course you can do a mixture of a blockbuster and like a hit television show, but then also do these independent films that like, you know, is going to get a new audience because your stars in it. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And it, it's, it's more of, um, yeah, even with, um, my gosh, I'm Florence, not Florence Pugh, um, not Florence by mail. My gosh, um, Millie Bobby Brown. Wow, I don't uh, know why it took me so long. Go. We were just talking <laughs> about Damsel before we, yeah, yeah, and like she's been produced like on her own films as well. And it's like, yeah. you know, they they want to be known for like, I think they're More. trying to build careers or not even that. It's just so, even with like Millie Bobby Brown or like any of the younger actors and mm -hmm. Dune part two, it's, it's almost like, God, I had the thought in my head. They're, they're trying to get people to recognize their name. Like, I don't know if it's like, like a movie star thing, but I'm glad that people are like, you know, following these actors and actresses. Cause it's like, you mm -hmm. want to see like where they came from, like their first film ever. Like, yeah, it's, it's so cool to like go back and like see where they came from and like go mm -hmm. through their entire filmography instead of it just being all one franchise, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I get what you're saying because then you see them grow um, yeah. and evolve into something. I, I like it's pure example. Like, I my first film of like Timothy Chalamet that I can remember, he was obviously an in interstellar, but like, I don't count that like that was the first time that I saw him in a movie. He was in interstellar, um, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, he's an in but that's what I'm saying. Like, no one knows he was an in interstellar, right? Yeah. It's like you go back and you're like, oh shit, like he's uh, he plays the son, and um, you don't realize Whoa. that. Yeah, that yeah, is Timmy. So technically wow. it's like, that's his first like film that I remember watching him in. But for me, yeah. it's always going to be call me by your name. That really showed me how mm, incredible yeah. of an actor he is. So it's like Timmy and I were the same age 
And it just, it hits different watching an actor that's like your age and you know that he's going to have longevity as a movie star yeah. and like tech, like you're growing with him and yeah. you're supporting him. And I think that's, what's incredible about this for all of them is that even like with Sydney Sweeney and you know, Tom Holland too, we can add that to the mix. Like we're mm -hmm. watching them grow and we're like around the same age range as they are, you know? So it's, it's, that special. is true. Yeah. It's like, even like when you're a kid, it's like, obviously, you know, you, like you get exposed to certain films that like your, mm -hmm. your parents watch, but it's, it's usually, you know, the Denzel Washington's Leonardo DiCaprio's. It's usually like they're, they're older. So you don't yeah. really have like yeah. the people it's that different. you want to follow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or not even the people that you want to follow. It's just, you know, when you're gosh, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 years old. There's not a lot of child, <laughs> child actors no, out there. But it's also, you're not going to be <laughs> like, um, you're not going to, have that yet because they're still like your yeah. age at the same time. Like for right. me, I guess the earliest one that I would say would be Zac Efron that I followed him. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Like Zac Efron, he's only, sure. I think three or four years older than us. And it's like that. Mm. He's the only one that I can think of where like he was a child actor and like that was, yeah. that was it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very true. I mean, of course, Josh Peck, Oppenheimer, Oppie. He yeah, was, he's he, an oppie. He, he got to press the uh, big red button. I was like, <laughs> okay, that was that was pretty awesome. But yeah, it's yeah. cool. Like, it's really cool to see that. So it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, God, this this movie was just incredible. I gotta go it's see amazing. it again. Yeah, same. I can't. I'm trying to bring as many people as I can uh, to go watch it in IMAX. It's got to be in 70 millimeter as well. You yeah, you can't exactly. watch it in regular. Like, it's impossible. You know, you no. Yeah. I think Josh Brolin had said it like he said it in an interview. He's like, see it in IMAX, see it in IMAX, see it in IMAX, see it. You have to like, even if it's just standard IMAX, it doesn't have to be 70 millimeter because not every theater yeah, and, carries um, it. has, yeah, carries that, especially here in the U S I'm not sure how it is in Canada, but there, we, we do not have a lot of them here, but luckily no. I live in a city where we I live like 10 minutes away from it. So it's like, that was really That's awesome. awesome. But it's yeah. cool to also hear like the film going in the back. Like you, you don't get that a lot. And I think the last time I saw that was what I think the first time I experienced 70 millimeter IMAX was with Oppenheimer. Same. And I was like, it was. Oh it, listen, <laughs> it, it just hits different. It does. I can't even, ex it's only like a couple of inches on the top and the bottom. At the bottom. For but 70 it, millimeter. Yeah, but it makes a world of difference. Because you're getting this incredible, like, height that you're not, like, it feels like, this is going to sound so weird, but it feels like a 4-3 aspect ratio. Oh, yeah, Do you get, for do sure. you get what I'm saying? It yeah. feels that way, and you're just, like, in the movie. Like, yeah. obviously in IMAX, you're always like, you feel like you're in the movie, but this time you just, you feel like you're there with Oppenheimer. You feel like you're there in Arrakis. Like it just hits different. The image quality is absolutely spectacular. Like I cannot praise this thing enough. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. The sound, everything about it. You're just like, yeah. Wow. And it cuts between like 70 millimeter and standard, but like mm -hmm. for, I would say for maybe a good like 65 to like 70% of the movie was like in full set, uh, 70 yeah. millimeter. And it's just like, especially yeah. the big battles, you're just like, wow. He played around with it. Wow. Again, it comes he down did. to the, like the scale of Arrakis and what he wanted to show. Yeah. Um, so I, I like that he did those changes. It felt like a real place. It did. Dude, I was like, it's like I would literally go there. Yeah. I I can. I'm like, where did you, where did you film this? Like, yeah, I know. where <laughs> where did you I go, know. Denis, to film this? I don't know what he did. I, I was like, this just looks like not not a a a pixel out of sight. I was like, oh. I every time I watch like Dune One in Part Two, I'm like I just feel like I'm there. I don't know yeah. what it is. It just <laughs> you feel like I can't even explain the feeling of watching like Dune One and Dune Two. Like it just I can't even explain it. It's so overwhelming, and you just get like so gassed, like watching Part One and Part Two. And it also comes down to like Hans Zimmer's score. I think that just. 
is it home. Oh my God. Like without it, some scenes, like they're nothing without it. I'm going to be yeah. honest. Like it No, hits. no, I, I, I agree. Did you watch part one before, like rewatch part one before? Did you I did. see it again in theaters or no? No, I watched, I had bought the 4K Same. and it was the first time I actually watched the 4K on my TV and I was like. Same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was <laughs> like, you know what? 4K is still incredible image quality. So I'm like, obviously it's not IMAX, but like yeah. watching it at home, I was like. Dude, even the 4K is just on another level. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a, I have an OLED television. I was like, I'm like, yeah. I, know, I was gonna, I was gonna watch it at some point, and yeah. like you know, and I was like, yeah, this is actually that was my first time like popping it in Same. my uh, 4K player. It's gorgeous. I was like, like, this is me. It's amazing. I wish I would have seen it in theaters because I know they were doing it for like a short time. Yeah, I was like. Man, but it, it made made a little bit of money, but I think I think Dune Part Two is going to hit a billion. Oh, it has to. to or close uh, to. No, it has to. Like they have to keep it in theaters for as long as they can, just to make up to. for the fact that they kind of snaked Legendary um, for Dune mm. Part One because they did snake them. I think that was like the big controversy yeah, there, right? That's um, right. Yeah, because during twenty twenty, Warner Brothers was like, "Surprise, we're doing the whole hybrid thing." Mm-hmm. And to yeah. me, and everyone was like, um, "What?" So like, and no. <laughs> even then, even then, Doom Part One like killed it at the Oscars. I know, I know, and I think that like obviously, it was we were talking about this before. Like, I'm already thinking of next year's Oscars because I don't think anything, nothing is coming close to Dune Part Two at all and then everyone's like but it's so early and i'm like no it's not where the it's the third month of it's the year not, it's not early because you know what else came out i think it was in march everything everywhere all at once it and did that one, that's and picture. exactly so i'm like what are you guys talking about it's not early like it, the second we start thinking about oscars for 2025 it starts january 1st like yeah. i i don't understand what like people are so rattled about it's like no no, no. we know when a movie hits like the second i watched oppenheimer i'm mm. like it's done like yeah, lock it up, done. everyone go yeah. home. Like it's done. I knew it the second I walked out of there and yeah. I still felt that with Doom Part 2. So when you know, you know, and I don't even mm-hmm. know what's coming out this year that could even come close to like it taking gold away from Doom Part 2. Yeah. And this is Warner Brothers. I mean, you know, say what you will about Warner Brothers. We, we've we've had our, our issues with them. But I mean, immense of all the controversy of like, you know, with David Zaslav and like how they're running the company, like... I mean, Barbie hit a billion dollars. Barbie hit the billy, man. Like, and they, and I think that's kudos to Margot Robbie more so mm. than Warner Brothers. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just because because it's just like, no, we're gonna keep this day, and yeah. they did. They listened to her, and if they didn't listen to her, I think it would have been a very different outcome because yeah. technically, like, the fans marketed both films for. Warner Brothers and Universal and at that Warzone. point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is crazy. And I'm saying they didn't market it because technically Oppie, you didn't really do much. There was just a timer. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I and didn't And it's really Christopher see... Nolan. Like, of course. And it's Nolan. See. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like the fans really did what they did for Barbenheimer to even happen and for them to both, well, Barbie hit the billy and Oppie didn't. Um Regardless, Which still blows my they mind. both did. Gr- yeah, but it's I weird because yeah. I I got the 4K for both. I got Oppenheimer through uh, through award season, and I actually was not expecting it. But um, and I request I I did a Blu-ray uh, 4K Blu-ray review for mm-hmm. Barbie, and just looking yeah. at not just, not just like the image quality, but like the other yeah. like the special features, the assets. That come with it. Um, mm. Yeah, Oppenheimer comes with like over three hours of like special features, like it's amazing deleted ki- cut, uh, deleted scenes, stuff like that. Barbie mm-hmm. has none of that. Barbie has like a few special featurettes, and then that's it. It yeah. didn't really. They didn't package you with anything. And we actually learned today, um, at as this recording of uh, March fourth, I almost said third, um, that apparently. Um, mm. there's not what going happened? to be, um, there's, there's not going to be any deleted scenes on the Doom part two, uh, Blu-ray release, which That's kind fine. of, 
And I, I think it's fine. It's just, I, I guess, as a, I mean, we're, we're both physical media collectors. So I'm just like, man, yeah. give, me, give me something. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be deleted scene. Because sometimes we're like, why wasn't this in the movie? Um, kind of thing. But I'm sure that, I mean, Denis had to make a lot of tough choices, even with, um, I forgot yeah. the guy's name. Uh, hold on one second. I need to find it. Um, Stephen Mc, uh, McKin- uh, McKinley's character. He was not in part two. Um, yes, I know who you're yeah. talking about. Yes, yes, yes. And I know that was a difficult decision because I kind of read into his uh, side plot mm. um, with Dune. And I was like, I feel like that would have hurt the pacing of the film. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I think th- I think there were already so many characters and then you had to introduce like Fade and you had to introduce Arulin and the Emperor. Like I think it was excessive, especially because you're starting like new characters. You know what I mean? And even the new characters didn't have that many scenes as well. Um, but the scenes that they did have worked. I'm not saying it didn't or else I would have given it like less than I did. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to do that. And, and I know Denise, like, he's not a fan of deleted scenes. He's like, this is the movie that I'm putting out. No one needs to watch anything else. So like, even on his other films, he's like, I'm not, I don't have to do the deleted scenes, which is interesting. Yeah. Then you have, and that's fine. You, you have a filmmaker of like Zack Snyder who has like five hours worth of footage and you're like, I want to see it too. Like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it, it yeah. depends, I guess, on the director. That's true. Even with like the Lord of the Rings, like the original <laughs> extended cut for yeah. Blu-ray. I still like, have to do we it. Had, well, like they, they have like a lot of like appendices and stuff. Cause like you have the movies on the Blu-ray disc and there's a lot of like DVDs for each movie, but like these mm-hmm. appendices. So there's so much that went with that, uh, mm-hmm. with, uh, with that special features and stuff for the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Like you're really yeah. not going to get that as much anymore. It kind of sucks because I, I feel like a lot of like the featurette stuff like you can just find on YouTube, but it would have been cool to for like a making of for Dune or something. Kind of like Disney Plus, like if if HBO Max did this, but for like movies like Dune or like any yeah. other or like Barbie be cool. even, because like, like you know that. yeah, yeah Disney Plus does like oh the making of what like do they do it for like every like Marvel show and like that is mm-hmm. or they did it for uh, Percy Jackson as well they and did. for Willow. And I was like, yeah, that's so they cool. Did. It but was like, awesome you know, that they did that. Just yeah. put that on the physical media. <laughs> it's on. like, but that's the thing. It's like these streaming services, they don't, they're greedy in certain cases. And they're like, but why would I like want to put that on a physical media? Like it just, it because doesn't. I'm paying for it. No, <laughs> no, but it's true. Like it's so frustrating because we like collecting them. And if we love the movie so much, we're obviously going to buy it. You know what I mean? So it's just. Yeah, they don't know what they're doing. I mean, they do business perspective wise. Not but really, like, but <laughs> no, it's okay. Trust me, give me, give me in the Warner Brothers seat. Give me in that 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 David Zaslav. I'm gonna shake some things up. It's like, We're gonna, we have to talk. We, I'm, I'm gonna take over his position and just. I'm telling you, we're we're gonna have Dune spinoffs, but not we need, like we need but all not, the Dune. Yeah, we need all the Dune, but not all at once. And I know Denis has um, stated that he is writing um, Messiah, but he doesn't want to just like, okay, on to the next one. Yeah. Like he wants to take his time with it. I'm like, dude, take your time. Like four, it's been four years since Doom Part 2. I can wait another four to five years. I will wait. Yeah, and I, I think Messiah is so heavy. It's so heavy, Messiah. It's just, it needs to be the right script. Um, and also if it takes longer, the actors are going to get older and it would make more sense for that to be like his, you know what I mean? Like he wants to do, I think another two or three films in between. So oh, even if he? we get like, yeah, it's oh, what boy. I, what he's been reading. Mm. I don't know, but it's like, that's, so do you think it's, it's got, is it a time jump between Dune and Dune Messiah or is, does it just get straight in? It's, it's straight in. Um, uh, but it just considering what the story is, it would make sense if they age. So I, uh, okay. I don't mind at least I'd say four years, four, four years. or five years. Four or yeah. five. Yeah, exactly. Four or five years. Yeah. I'm no, cool no more. with that. 
No less. Yeah. Because if he's going to reach that level of per, like, pers- oh my God, if he's going to reach that level of perfection again, then work, buddy. Just work. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. And then, you know, on to something else. Because I, I would love, like, obviously I want him to continue. It's, I want him to work on doing as much as he can, but I also want to see other yeah. s- stuff from him as well. But yeah. it's great, it's great stuff. But we've, wow, we've been talking for a while. Uh, but let's get into this kind of like final thoughts of the film. I'll pass it back over to you. And yeah, um, yeah while you're at it, after you give your final thoughts, let everyone know yeah. where they can find you. Because it's been amazing, of course, as always, Damn. having you on. It was a great conversation. Yeah. I didn't know where this conversation was going to go. No. I know. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, it's an hour. It's like, whoa, we just, we did, uh, we covered a lot. We talked we really about did. a lot of topics all because of Dune part two. Um, what I can say is that this movie deserves multiple viewings. Um, at least one of them should be in 70 millimeter. Uh, it's hard to go back to a regular screen after it, but just definitely go multiple times. This is such a phenomenal film. It's a monumental moment for these young stars. And uh, it's a monumental moment for Denis Villeneuve and his career. And I think that's really important uh, for all of us to just take note of that. It's a big deal for him to cement his sel- himself as like the greatest sci-fi director of all time and and that comes with like technological advancements as well that he's allowed to tap into different visuals with you know his dp greg frazier i think this is going to be like the perfect sci-fi film it's going to be like textbook for years to come and i think that it's going to be the new blueprint uh, which is absolutely incredible that it's Denis Villeneuve, one of the greatest working directors uh, of our generation. I think that he's absolutely incredible and deserves like all the recognition for this. Let's get Dune Part 2 to a billion just to retcon what happened with Dune Part 1. I think that Warner Brothers needs to just see that they have a hit on their hands and I think they already do. Uh, but we just need to get this to a billion dollars for the sake of Denis Villeneuve and the Dune universe. So, uh, yeah, this was amazing. Christian, thank you so much for having me on for this. Uh, I want everyone to read Dune Messiah right after and just like freak out with me cause it's heavy. Um, but you guys can always follow me over at AMX NDA Reviews on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. And you can check out my website, candidxcinema.com and my YouTube candid cinema. All right. Yeah, I thank you again for coming on. It's it's really it's 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 always a great conversation for sure. It's mm-hmm. just yeah, like uh Amanda said, th- this is a technical masterpiece. Like in every uh, like phrase it's it's just amazing. It's See true. it in IMAX, please. It is suited for the IMAX experience. It's formatted for IMAX. Like this is a carefully like crafted spectacle. Um mm-hmm. I think we're supposed to get um, I think they're supposed to re-release Dune Part One with the IMAX ratio. I think. I think yeah, they could I, have done. I saw like it somewhere a, on Twitter. I think I'm they're doing sure. like a back-to-back, like Part One, Part Two movie going oh, experience I'll, I'll buy it too. Again. I'll buy it again. I don't. Oh care. yeah, I'll absolutely <laughs> go. <laughs> Five hours. Yeah. Five hours. I don't care. I'll do it. Yeah. But seriously, for anyone, like a lot of people was talking like at work and they're like, oh, yeah, they're like, oh, part two. Like my friend Colin, he didn't see part one. He was trying to he tried to watch like a five minute video beforehand. Bro, and he, what are you he tried. Doing? He wanted to watch part one beforehand, but he, he he's pretty busy. He's, he's got a pretty busy schedule. I'm like, I'm like, well, I guess we can <laughs> we can watch it. I'll be like, I'll watch part one again, you know, like, you know, and. God. It's I'm I'm interested to go back. I'm interested to go back to part one, knowing that everything happens in part two, because it's much like with uh N2 and across the Spider-Verse. Like Into the Spider-Verse is a phenomenal movie. I'm not saying part one isn't good, it's just that part two enhances part one so much. Yeah. So like after I watch Across the Spider-Verse, it was I think it was like a few weeks later I went back and watched Into the Spider-Verse and I had a newfound appreciation for it. And it's yeah. yeah. Go see Dune Part 2 in 
IMAX. <laughs> do and, it, um, do it. <laughs> and of course, all of the go follow Amanda on all the, the social media garbage that we have out there. I'll have her links in the description of this podcast episode. And with all that said, that does conclude today's episode. If you enjoy what you heard, make sure to subscribe to our podcast on your preferred podcast platform of choice. Make sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and threads at from optics. That is optics with an X. And don't forget to share an episode of our podcast with a fellow movie lo- lover, whether it be your mother, your brother, or your significant other spread the love for the film optics podcast. And really quick, uh, what's for new review releases that we have out right now, as I mentioned earlier, you can listen to our Dune Part 2 spoiler-free review that Devin and I covered. It's about 30-ish minutes. Uh, This one, obviously, much longer. Um, (laughs) You can also check out our Avatar The Last Air Bender Netflix series uh, review. That is full spoilers because... Yeah, it's been out for 20 years. <laughs> so this is the, the Netflix series version. It's fun. Um, also, definitely check out our Madam Web review. And yeah, there's that. And I'm, I'm, uh, we did like a most anticipated movies of 2024 episode. And Doom Part 2 is my number one. I was, I was nervous. I was a little nervous. I'm like, oh, man, like. Can he follow this up? And yeah, I was just, I was blown away. So definitely check out those reviews that we have out right now. And for upcoming, we're going to be covering like Invincible Season 2, Part 2. And I will be doing a quick review of Damsel that will be streaming on Netflix. I believe that is also produced by Millie Bobby Brown, if I'm not mistaken. She is out there making that money, um, as, as she should be. But... With all that said, again, thank you, Amanda, for coming on. And thank you again for all of our listeners out there. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy the show, please take a moment to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And stay connected with us by following us on Twitter. For the latest updates, that was Amanda and I'm Christian signing off. And remember, let the spice flow.